the whole talk um, and just to keep things orderly. Um, so now I'll go ahead and, and introduce our speaker. So Dr. Wood is a, pa a paleontologist who specializes in carbonate production and biomineralization. She received her undergraduate at the University of Bristol and her PhD at the Open University. From early on in her career, Rachel developed our understanding of biomineralizers and particularly reef builders. From stromatoperoids to archaeocyatha to cloudina, Rachel's done it all. Among her research contributions, her expertise is very well represented in her book, Reef Evolution, published in 1999. Her current appointment is as Professor of Carbonate Geoscience at the University of Edinburgh, where she continues her research and extends her knowledge into the Ediacaran period. Combining traditional, uh, tr traditional paleontology, iron and phosphorus speciation data and statistics, today Rachel will talk to us about the transition from the Ediacaran biota to the Cambrian biota. And with that, Rachel, I'm gonna turn the stage over to you. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, many thanks for the invitation. And I just first of wanted to say, thank you, Alex, for all your hard work of putting this series together. You've done a great thing for the, the general holistic pre-Cambrian community. So thank you very, very much. Um, hello, friends and colleagues. It's been such a long time since we met. Who knows when we will meet again? But nice to see you all virtually, and I hope you are all um, well in body and soul. So I've, I've deliberately put together, um, given the audience, a provocative talk to um, generate some discussion. Uh, I just wanted to say you, there are much of this work I'm going to present is the work of uh, current and former PhD students uh, and also many colleagues from around the world. I'm a huge believer in international research. So we have here colleagues from Russia, from Namibia, uh, Germany, and so forth. And it's very much to tackle this problem of tracing the roots and drivers of the Cambrian explosion is very much an integrative uh, interdisciplinary endeavor. So this is really the work, not only of paleontologists, but uh, geochemists, sedimentologists, uh, stratigraphers. So I want to consider, okay, so my screen is absolutely frozen. Oh, why has it done that? Okay, I'm gonna just stop oh. sharing and uh, go to another. So that was gonna be my happened. suggestion. Yeah, um. there we go. Okay, that's working. So um, I just want to consider three, uh, three. Rachel, we don't, we don't see your screen. I don't know if you <sighs> tried the screen. Share again. Is that working now? Yes, yeah, so it's just not in presenter mode yet. Okay, there we go. Great. Sorry about these these technical hitches. So three um, interrelated hypotheses, if you like. So first of all, um, and 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 really, they all address this overarching issue of what is the relationship between environmental change? How does it, how does it create permissive environments, uh, opportunities, if you like, in which the there is, uh, creates the conditions for environmental innovation? So we know that this rather simplistic image of a linear development of the, the, the rise and ever increasing march of complexity, uh, this, this linear narrative is far from the truth. There are constant feedbacks in all sorts of, of shapes and, and forms. So it's really this, this, in, this dialogue between environmental opportunity and evolutionary innovation that I want to explore. So where are the roots of the Cambrian explosion? So you're probably all familiar with diagrams like this, um, time with the, with the uh, snowball earths and just sort of lined up with the record that we have of uh, biota. Now, of course, we know that some of this early biota, particularly these, you know, the lantean and these um, phosphatized embryos are almost certainly not animals, but uh, of course that is disputed. And as we sort of move towards the right here, we are increasingly get, getting biota that, uh, that uh, paleobiologists are increasingly more um, confident that they represent animals. And probably by the time we certainly get to Claudina here, this, this biralized tube, and there's a reasonable consensus that this, this really is a metazoan. 
uh, traditionally, we've thought of the Ediacara biota as being separate from the Cambrian biota, and that these are potentially uh, uh, separated by a mass extinction somewhere around the Precambrian Cambrian boundary. But the waters have been somewhat muddied recently by, first of all, the finding, the dating of ash beds in Namibia, which show that this boundary is, is almost certainly younger than we realize, somewhere around 539, even 538.5 million years. So the, the boundary has been pushed uh, a couple of million years into uh, younger. Uh, in addition, we now have examples of small shelly fossils found in Siberia that certainly extend into the terminal Ediacara. In other words, they predate uh, the uh, indications we have of where the Precambrian Cambrian boundary or the Ediacara and Cambrian boundary is there. So these biotas now seem to overlap by a couple of million years. And this rather questions the existence of a mass extinction. But of course, this is still rather unresolved. But notwithstanding that, the fact that if we line up a lot of the uh, metrics of um, complexity, so things like lo locomotion, burrowing, bimineralization, and so forth. Now, you might disagree with exactly where these uh, metrics sit. Without doubt, they sit on this transition, this transition from the Ediacara and starting uh, shortly after the Gascars and continuing through into the Lower Cambrian. So we really should think about this event as being an Ediacaran Cambrian transition. So how, how might we consider the roots? Now, of course, it's a slightly uh, moot question because, of course, the moots are always deeper and deeper. And how do you define an actual root? However, um, just to highlight a couple of bits of recent work. So first of all, um, here's a cloudinomorph, or here's cloudina, which has this uh, bimineralized skeleton. Uh, similar non biomineralized examples have been found by Nevada, and CT scanning has shown the existence of this very curious, crumpled pyritic structure in the center, which has been proposed to be a gut. Uh, and indeed, if it's a gut, uh, the Jim Schiffbauer and his colleagues have suggested that this is best represented by a stem group annelid, uh, rather than a, a dead end gut, as you would find in, say, a uh, cnidarium, which was, is the other favored. Um, uh, affinity for Cloudina. Now, of course, this is this is slightly controversial. Is it or isn't isn't it a gut? But nonetheless, it's a possibility that it is a gut, and indeed, it is. Therefore, uh, these Cloudinomorphs are some form of bilaterians. Also, in Narmaclathus, so Narmaclathus is this rather curious uh, goblet-shaped fossil with these open uh, facets, originally described about twenty years ago. And again, we've not really been very sure what this form is. And a recent finding, again, of pyritized fossils. Here's a slab. It's actually covered these uh, at least 70 of these beautiful little uh, Narmacalathus and a few Cloudinas as well. And if we zoom in here, you can see that they preserve uh, features that are simply not present when you have only the, the goblet-shaped skeletal structure. And this is a surface, you can see it's got this wrinkled uh, edge, these folds, and it in fact has five or six, I should say, between five and seven lobes. Uh, this example has six and possible little tiny uh, surficial tuberances here. It's not really clear if these are actually biological features or they're just some form of, of surficial weathering of the pyrite. But nonetheless, this is a fossil preserved with a mass of pyrite, which in this case has been weathered on the surface to iron hydroxyoxides. And looking at this in a little bit more detail, here's another uh, example. And this uh, first example, this is work of a, a PhD student, Amy um, Shaw. We CT scanned it. And here you can see these beautifully expressed, these lobes uh, labeled LO, and there are six of them all converging around the central orifice. Uh, it turns out that there are traces of pyrite in the skeleton as well, and I'll show this uh, to you in a minute, and these allow the calcite skeleton itself to be picked out. And here it is, in addition with the lumens in the sides. So in other words, we have the, the basal uh, calcareous skeleton and these lumens and this soft tissue sitting mostly on top forming these lobes with this complex folding arrangement at the top. 
Now also, uh, here's a cross section just to show you the, the skeleton here underneath, and then these two lobes, and then a, a third lobe just coming into section in the back. Now, intriguingly, also preserved, associated with these fossils are these spiral, uh, these um, um, some sort of bacterial, macrobacteria, beautifully preserved, but also this curious structure labeled here CT, a central tube. And when we look at serial cross sections through this fossil, again, here is the skeleton. Uh, you can see this tube appearing in all these sections. Uh, this is a section then through absolute the center of the of the fossil and the, the tube is very, very small and slightly elliptical. But as we move away from the center, the tube is inflating, becoming asymmetric, uh, moving towards the side, and then it starts actually to get smaller again and disappears before the edge of the, the uh, skeleton. So we have a structure here which is also pyrotized. It's a J shape. And it seems to be attached to this main membrane here that extends across the two lobes. What these serial sections also show us is this particular narmaclathus is very, very spiny. Here's one particularly large spine. And the spines, there's another one here, are filled with pyrite. There's one here and here. In other words, there are pores. There are pores that extend from the outside to the inside of the skeleton. Inside the skeleton, the calcareous skeleton, we have this wisp of pyrite as well. Uh, and also um, the pyrite extends on the outside of the skeleton. So there's pyrite everywhere. The lobes, the central structure, this curious membrane that seems to drape across the central cavity, connecting the central structure within the spines as, as pores on the outside and on the inside. I should just add, here's another CT scan. And again, you can see the central structure. Here it is coming down in a slight J shape here, different sections. And we've interrogated four of these specimens and three out of the four all show this, this tube in a similar position. So it's undoubtedly a feature of these, uh, this fossil, Narmacolathus. Just looking at SEM images, just to confirm, this is all, uh, these are made of, all, all the pyrite is now oxidized, as I said, but it's present as framboids. And here you can see just an absolute mass of framboids. Also, the framboids are present within the pores. There's a pore, and again, framboids are present. Framboids are present in this curious membrane draping across the central cavity and in the central tube. And also very interestingly, the framboids are present in this central part of the skeleton. And you can see here, it's forming a sort of V shape. This is a, a tangential section. And enlarged here in J, you can see the framboids picking out what seems to be a growth increment in the skeleton. Now, it's one thing we know about framboids, they form under sulfate production in waters that are, are, um, are, have, have a limited amount of iron, but also have a limited amount of uh, organic matter. So they really um, precipitate within localized organic matter and they form very, very rapidly within days and sometimes even hours. So we know the presence of these framboids, even though they're now oxidized, really is a very, very good indication of the previous presence of soft tissue. So we're reconstructing all these areas that, that show framboids as having, uh, as recording the former presence of soft tissue, mostly in the form of these lobes, but also this membrane, this, this CT structure inside the pores within the body cavity and also on the outside. And additionally, within this organic, this inferred organic rich area in the middle of the skeleton, so putting all these data together, uh, this is our best guess, the reconstruction now of the Narmaclathus animal. We're pretty confident that it had this tripartite skeleton, this organic rich central part, which is, is and we know this from SEM images as well. We have soft tissue on the inside. We have soft tissue within the puncti. We seem to have some sort of uh, soft tissue displaced around the lumens. We have lobes. 
we may or may not have tentacles. These are very, very tentative. But we certainly have some sort of structure here that has a consistent arrangement. And where our best guess at the moment is that this is a gut. It doesn't really seem to follow a organization of a inflated um, a cavity as, as you would find in cnidarians. Uh, so all these features together are really rather similar to a whole series of fossils we find in the Lower Cambrian. Here's just one example, uh, cotyledion. And again, it shares, cotyledion shares these features of this goblet overall shaped morphology, having a hexaranial hex symmetry. And cotyledion has this very, very well-preserved U-shaped gut, which is held within a presumed tentacle collar, although it's not very well preserved in this case, as it is in, uh, also not really present in Narmacalathus, and also shows bilateral budding. Uh, and our best guess for the affinity of cotyledion is that this is some sort of enteropt. Now, enteropts are very curious. They're modern, they, they, they're, they're, they're present today. They're an enigmatic monophyletic group. Today, they're very, very small but uh, they seem to occupy this basal position within the Lophotrochozoans, fairly close to mollusks. So of course, this is not, uh, this is tentative, it's not fully uh, clear, but it's really quite difficult to explain this organization in uh, anything other than a probable Lophotrochozoan uh, body plan. Uh, and of course, this makes total sense when you look at the uh, inferred phylogeny of the metazoans on the basis of, of molecular phylogenies. Uh, here is the basal lof lophotrochozoa. They were almost certainly present in the Ediacaran. And of course, our data point is way up here in the terminal Ediacaran. And likewise, Claudina here uh, being a, it, it's entirely compatible with the phyl phylogeny that this could be a stem annelid of some. So I think whilst these data are um, suggestive, they're not uh, absolute, but I think we will be seeing in the next few years a lot more information coming out via exceptional preservation to try and resolve the affinity of what have previously been enigmatic Ediacaran metazoans. So moving on to the sex to uh, second topic, uh, oxygen. So of course, this has been a hot topic for many, many years. Uh, knowing the oxygen requirements of uh, these uh, possible, these certainly complex life, some of them may be metazoans, is problematic. Um, but as I'm sure many of you know, uh, it was suggested uh, in the last uh, six or seven years ago that some basal invertebr invertebrates, which have, have metabolically undemanding lifestyles, particularly sessile lifestyles, actually have fairly low oxygen requirements. And here's this uh, breadcrumb sponge shown to have really quite remarkably low um, oxygen requirements. Uh, and this raised the question, uh, the idea that maybe these earliest metazoans themselves might have had low oxygen requirements. Indeed, many of them are sessile, so that might be compatible with this idea. So I just want to present some data now that weathering controlled the local redox in the Ediacar and Cambrian transition, and also that these oldest metazoans really don't seem to have had low oxygen demands. So uh, going to the Nama group, uh, many of you are familiar with the Nama group, but one of the reasons we go there is that the outcrops are spectacular, very little vegetation cover, the, the correlations are very straightforward for the most part. And of course they have a rich biota of not only skeletal fossils, but soft, uh, soft bodied uh, Edukara biota and also trace fossils. So we can, we can start to integrate this biotic data with geochemical data. So we've been working for, for some years in both these basins. And the nice thing is there are two separate basins. Uh, and so we can compare the behavior of these two basins uh, with each other to test for the uh, local the controls of local redox dynamics. Uh, there are fairly well dated ash beds and we have a, a very long record, for example, of Claudina here shown in purple throughout uh, the whole of the Nama group. 
So we've been concentrating on generating these shelf to basin transects in both the northern Zaris Basin and here in the southern basin. Uh, to create an inventory of the evolution of redox through time, in other words, 4D, uh, 4D redox uh, data set. So we've been looking really at the, to try and understand the presence or absence of oxia and anoxia. Anoxia, by the way, for those who don't know, is a name of a Norwegian death metal band. So there are, a, there's a huge a number of proxies that we can choose. We can choose local proxies or uh, global proxies. My, my preference is for local proxies sim simply because local proxies can then be combined with a local in biotic inventory to really understand the local dynamics. This is particularly important since we know that the uh, redox of the, of the Ediacara and the terminal Ediacara was extremely heterogeneous. So going for these local stories or these regional stories, I think is extremely important. But just going to uh, global proxies for a moment, here are some uh, uranium isotope data. And uh, this is work from Rosie Tostevin. And here she's uh, generated um, uranium isotope data from the base of the NAMA. And you can see there's this remarkable shift in uranium isotopes to these really quite dramatic uh, um, uh, anoxic conditions, and she correlated these with a sim similar finding from two different sections from South China. And this led to the idea that there was a global shift to more anoxic conditions, in other words, a, a higher proportion of the seafloor being anoxic at around 547 million years ago. As I said, our preference is for local redox proxies. Uh, you're all familiar with the iron uh, speciation proxy. Uh, the problem with this proxy, however, is it's really uh, rather black and white. It tells us if conditions were either oxic, anoxic, and then dif differentiates between ferruginous and oxic, euxinic, but it doesn't help with looking at intermediate oxic states, in other words, low oxygen or higher oxygen. So this is where the use of cerium anomalies comes in. Uh, cerium three and four are very, very sensitive uh, to uh, low oxygen versus higher, higher oxygen conditions. And these are, the behavior of these two cerium, the cerium pair is also mirrored very nicely by the behavior of manganese. And the redox proxy, the redox potential for manganese two to four is at a lower redox potential compared to uh, the iron speciation, the, the proxies used for iron speciation. So when we compare these two, we can not only back out oxic and uh, anoxic, be it ferruginous or euxinic, but we can also use this as a proxy for intermediate oxic levels, manganous low oxygen levels. So we've put this together for the uh, um, for, for the whole of the NAMA group, and this is mostly work from a former uh, PhD student Fred Boyan and current postdoc. And you can see here the color coding just according to oxic, manganous in, in purple, and anoxic, in this case, ferruginous. Uh, the color coding for the two basins following these shelf to basin transects. So, so going from the base of the Nama, which is approximately 550, up to the, the top of the Nama, which is approximately 538. And it's pretty obvious from these cartoons that we have an extremely dynamic hemocline. Uh, and, but the first thing that is clear is that you can see here the cartoons of life life is clinging to these well oxygenated habits it is never found in these manganous zones so the first thing we can say is that the presence of these low oxygen waters these manganous intermediate oxic state waters limited the habitable space for these animals these oldest animals in the nama group there were oxic oases the second thing is that the chemocline is remarkably dynamic, or the redoxic line, I should say. And these are just a few snapshots through time. First of all, the two basins have independent histories. They're not related to each other. They must be responding to something happening independently in the basins. Uh, and secondly, it, the, we have quite uh, a high, shallow chemocline at the base of the NAMA, where, that, where we, we predominantly have uh, a, a dominant ferruginous oxic state with only uh, intermittent, more, much more intermittent oxic horizons. And in effect, these slowly become 
uh, anoxic horizons start to fade away, although there are, there are times when they really come back with a vengeance. But eventually, at around 545 million years or so, uh, the redox decline starts to shoal away. And by about 542 million years ago, uh, it's really starting to disappear, and we end up with fully oxygenated conditions by the end of the Nama group. And here are a series of <clears throat> plain uh, um, views, plan views over these two basins, just showing how dynamic this, this, uh, these waters are coming and going uh, through the history of the Nama group. So in other words, we see progressive stabilization of oxygenation through time, starting at around 545 and then really stabilizing by about 542 million years. So the big question is what drove the stabilization of oxygen? Now there are multiple proxies that could be used and I just want to mention one here, which is the chemical index of alteration. And this is a well-known proxy that just really looks at this uh, relationship between the immobile and mobile clay minerals uh, as a, a fact, uh, to, to give a, a quantification of the changing, um, uh, um, yeah, changing rate of weathering uh, of continental weathering um, through time. So here are the data again. Um, just uh, here is the uh, CIA data plotted through this interval. And just to mention here is just for the for, for completeness, the iron speciation data for the different settings, starting with outer ramp, mid ramp, through to inner ramp. And you can see that the chemical index of alteration, there are a few moments, so particularly here in the Vingabrik member, there's a real pulse of weathering, a very, very short lived pulse of weathering. And we think this may be related to uh, an injection of weathering from the east of the Kalahari Crater, possibly related to a very, very short-lived deglaciation. But it's definitely a, a, a very short-lived uh, weathering event on a flooding surface at this time. But overall, the general uh, relationship is one of uh, pretty high uh, in indices of weathering at the base of the Nama, coincident when we have this dominant anoxic regime and then slowly decreasing through time and ending up with really much, much lower, uh, um, lower percentage. So this seems to uh, indicate that through progressively through the Nama, except for this uh, interval in the middle here with this a bit of real injection of continental weathering, we have an overall decreased amount of con continental weathering through time. How did animals respond? Well, this is just a compilation of everything we find and where we find it in the Nama. Uh, the, the, the settings are, are pretty, um, uh, nobody I think would dispute these settings, but what is disputed perhaps is the, is the number of taxa that's still slightly uh, uncertain. But what you can see is the, the skeletal biota start to migrate into the middle and outer ramp at the very, very end of the Nama. Also, we know from the work of, of Simon Darrick and his uh, research group that the intensity of bioturbation increases through time, but it particularly, again, at the very, very end of the Nama. So it seems that uh, biota is responding to this increased stabilization of, of, of oxia, particularly at the end of the, uh, the deposition of the Nama group by a, the response is increasing bioturbation intensity and also the, the, the uh, skeletal biota starting to migrate down the ramp into more and more oxygenated waters as the chemocline fades away, um, going, going out into the, um, into the basin. So we have here a potential for a close relationship between the co-evolution of oxygen and life. Now, I was going to present the phosphorus speciation data, but I realized I was going to seriously run out of time if I did. But I know that Fred is actually in the audience. So we, if you want to get onto this, I will perhaps defer to him as the um, main author of this work. But in effect, what we believe is the case is in the lower part of the Nama, we have this in, uh, high rates of continental weathering, possibly a bit of upwelling, but it's not really clear. But this created a high nutrient input. This created a lot of productivity, high primary productivity, which of course in due course creates 
um, an oxygen demand and creates a thickened wedge of the oxygen minimum zone. In, in this case, showing that the, the NAMA or, or explaining why the base of the NAMA, the lower NAMA, has this very high redoxic line. Uh, the phosphorus speciation data show that there's actually limited phosphorus recycling here in the lower NAMA. When we move to the, the upper parts of the NAMA, we can show that there's lower continental weathering and therefore lower nutrient input, a reduced primary producti productivity. And indeed, this is uh, borne out by the phosphorus speciation data, which shows that there is no recycling and much more efficient phosphorus burial. There's possibly some sort of sink switching between uh, organic uh, phosphorus and, and uh, uh, iron bound phosphorus into orthogenic uh, phosphorus. So the, the behavior of the phosphorus, which is determined by the redox, seems to support this idea that the, the weathering itself and the, the diminution of weathering is creating this, this stabilization of oxygen. So this is interesting because we have a particular dynamic on the Kalahari uh, uh, craton with this um, weathering coming from the east. However, in other parts of the, um, the globe, we may have a very, very different story. Now, what's interesting is to compare this, of course, to the uh, uranium isotope story, the global proxy, which suggests a widespread increase in anoxia at around 547. So the local data really shows something completely different. Of course, these aren't necessarily incompatible. The uranium isotope data really only tell us about, or via the models, they tell us about the uh, estimated percentage of anox anoxic seafloor. And of course, a lot of this an anoxic seafloor could be basinal, abyssal, it could be on the shelves. In other words, it may not impinge in any way on this, these very, very shallow shelves and ramps where the earliest macrobiota is actually living. So these, these two data sets, the local and, and the global, um, are telling us very, very different things, but are not necessarily incompatible. So if this is true, and we have this dynamic here in the Kalahari crater of in, uh, initially high rates of continental weathering and then decreasing through time, um, this really is a very, very different story for that which is emerging, for example, in South China, which is sitting uh, just above the equator, just north of the equator, um, perhaps, although the, um, these paleogeographic paleo positions are, are, not, uh, are still approximate. But we know here that we have really very, very prolonged uh, euxinic conditions, so extreme anoxic conditions through much of the same interval. And it remains to be seen what the drivers are in South China and how we can start to then build up a story of the regional dynamics for these major areas uh, which are, are yielding biotas and how these may all fit together into a more integrated story of weathering and tectonics. So finally, I just want to consider how we use metrics. So uh, I think this is a problem that has not really been fully resolved to date or even sort of fully contemplated. And really, it's because very often when uh, geochemical data are presented to look at the evolution of redox through time, very often the only metric presented is biodiversity. Now, we know that hidden within biodiversity are many, many other metrics. Biodiversity is simply a sum of the rate of origination and the rate of extinction. But there are other metrics that are potentially useful as well. So I want to consider the metrics from for biodiversity, evolutionary rates, and body size. And I should have mentioned, I've put up this figure, uh, the sort of current understanding, but we all know this is very much a work in progress of the changing uh, oxygenation of the, of the seas through time. We now believe rather than it being a linear progressive oxygenation, we have these, these oceanic oxic events, and they're just four of these labels I just mentioned here, uh, outlined here where I was talking in, in Namibia, uh, the last 10 million years before the Ediacar and Cambrian boundary. And some of the anoxic events known have been given names. Uh, there will almost certainly be many more than this uh, waiting to be discovered and named. So I really wanted to consider the relationship between 
These potential oxic events, the di highly dynamic redox of the Ediacaran and Cambrian, and how we might really start to scrutinize them in terms of biological response, trying to get away from the simple metric of biodiversity. So body size. <clears throat> so we know body size is very, very variable, uh, often within species. And we know also that body size uh, tends to increase on average through the lifetime of a lineage or a clade. This was an idea um, espoused or created by Edward Drinker Coke, the American paleontologist. And uh, it was really based on the very simple idea that big, eat, big fish eat little fish and bigger fish eat them. In other words, it's a really good idea to be big. The bigger you are, the better predator you are, the better competitor, the better you are, at, you have a higher fecundity. So all sorts of metrics about natural selective fitness correlate with body size. Now, when I was an undergraduate about 100 years ago, this idea of Cope's law of um, uh, the, the size of um, biota increasing through a lineage was really poo-pooed. It was thought to be a, a crazy idea, but it was really resurrected with great aplomb in the 21st century. <clears throat> so this is some data, uh, remarkable data set produced by the Stanford group. And you can see here that they've compiled data from these five major clades through the whole of the Phanerozoic. And you can see on average, everything really is getting bigger through time, looking at these very, very large data sets. Here we're looking at, 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 at biovolume, a log scale of biovolume. <clears throat> also, there's a lot of work looking at the impact of size as a result of stress, in particularly in relation to mass extinctions. And this is known as a Lilliput effect. Things just get really small when uh, in response to a, a catastrophic uh, effect. And this is particularly important, or has been particularly well documented as a result of anoxia. So here we have the, the, the Permo-Triassic uh, Permo um, extinction. I've just highlighted here a time of immediate, uh, immediately after the extinction of incredibly enhanced anoxia as shown on the basis of uranium isotopes. And you can see coincident with this huge increase of anoxia is this whopping decrease in the maximum uh, body size of gastropods. And it takes really quite a while, quite some million years for them to recover to their former size. Now, in this case, you can see that body size is tracking diversity nicely. So these two metrics really are going hand in hand in this, in this case. <clears throat> now, we have intervals as well where it's been suggested that overall in these very, very large data sets that body size is correlated to increased oxygenation through time. And this again is from the Stanford group correlating uh, the average uh, biovolume through time and, and correlating it with how we believe oxygen in terms of uh, how oxygenation has progressed through time. With these two major jumps, jumps at the great oxygenation event and then again in the uh, Ediacaran to Cambrian, the, 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 the so-called neoproterozoic oxidation. So these again are very, very large data sets evoking uh, cause and effect, increased oxygenation pr promoting a larger body size. But what about very uh, high resolution studies and body size through just the Cambrian radiation? So I consider some data from Siberia with my, my good colleague Andrei Zhravlov. And we, we just assembled some data for these four Cambrian groups simply because they, those are ones that we were familiar with and we could gather a lot of body size data, both from literature, but also from our own observations. And when we fostered the data together, they showed some remarkable size changes that were very, very dynamic. So here it is color coded according to these groups and we've split out the brachiopods into the uh, phosphatic linguliformians and then the calcareous um, rinconelliformians. And you can see that, at, I've, I've used here the Siberian time scale, um, but here through time, you can see effectively from the beginning of the Cambrian, relatively small 
body size, and then this crescendo in many groups towards the end of the Timotian, uh, and then a decrease, and then a dramatic decrease at the Sinskeven. This is the first mass extinction event of the of the Phanerozoic uh, towards the end of the Lower Cambrian, uh, almost certainly due to a, a, uh, a flooding of anoxic waters onto the shallow shelves, and it's recognised globally, but it's particularly um, uh, strong in um, in Siberia on the Siberian platform, and then the recovery in some groups after the Sinsk event. So it was clear that there are very dynamic but very very short term timescales on million year timescales through this interval. So putting this apart a bit, um, just just to show the number of species we looked at, um, these are simply uh, box and whisper plots of the longest linear. Uh, measurement, so cup diameter, aperture width, and conch length in these three groups. Uh, the blue line here is just the a, a line through the uh, mean. Sorry, the median, the median, and you can see that all these groups show this tremendous increase in uh, fluctuating, this in increase of body size, decrease, increase, and so forth. And I've just highlighted in blue where the largest uh, sizes occur in each of these groups. And what's remarkable are these are broadly synchronous. In other words, all these three groups, which are not related, are waxing and waning in body size more or less synchronously. They also show a tremendous decrease um, in body size. In other words, the Lilliput effect after the Sinsk event. However, if I add now the brachiopods, uh, and we, we see here a totally different story. Very large body size at the beginning of the Cambrian, and then a decrease, decrease through the remainder of the uh, lower Cambrian until the Sinsk event, and then a dramatic increase after the Sinsk event. So the brachiopods are showing a really very, very different story to the other groups. More remarkably, some of we noticed that some individual species so show a size change through time and these plots are simply individual species <clears throat> that show a size change so we haven't plotted those that show no size change these are simply those that show a size change and you can see some of these archaeocyas really are showing a dramatic increase of size synchronously and then a dramatic decrease in size synchronously and the, the healthy leonid mollusks and also the hylis are showing the same dynamic. By contrast, the brachiopods show the Lilliput effect after the Sinsk event, and then a wonderful burgeoning of size increase after, thereafter. So in other words, it seems to us that there is a tremendous role for physiology here. In other words, different groups really are reacting very, very differently, and it's the different physiological reactions here that are perhaps the underpinning dynamic for, for, for creating the, the, the extraordinary and unique record that we see of the Cambrian radiation. They're determining these, these differential physiological responses are determining these dynamics of, of web, um, uh, ebbing and flowing of these taxa, but they're also determining perhaps its demise why are the brachiopods surviving the Sinsk event when other groups are not? Now, let's consider the relationship between body size and biodiversity. <clears throat> so remember, biodiversity is often the metric of choice to try and interrogate the, the going back to this idea of, of envir environmental opportunity and evolutionary innovation. So again, all I've, I've added here is total uh, diversity in red. And you can see, the hylids are very well behaved. They are body size is synchronous with <clears throat> biodiversity changes. Crudely the same in archaeocyaths. Uh, Helcyon lenoid uh, mollusks, not quite so much, and really no correlation at all with the brachiopods. In other words, all metrics are not the same. They really are telling us something very different. So picking apart biodiversity a bit, if I just take the archaeocyaths and rates of origination. So I've added now in yellow the rate of origination. And you can see that there are two major origination events. 
that are synchronous with the largest number of species. In other words, at sort of the end of T4 to A1 and then again in B1. So in other words, uh, we have two origination rates and what they do is they increase the number of larger species at that time. However, if we now add the extinction events, the extinction events <clears throat> post-date, as you would expect, these major origination events, and they preferentially remove the large species, both times, both in the middle of the Activanian and at the Sinsk. So that's all behaving as one would expect it to behave. However, what about the hyaliths? So here I've added the origination rates and they are doing something very, very different. The origination here only increases the number of larger species only after the mid Atabanian here. And most notably at the end of the Sinsk. So it's playing a different role. It, the rate of origination is having a different um, dynamic on body size. And also, if we now look at extinction rates, the extinction is only driving the increase in size in the late Tomotian. So again, here, it, in, it, by preferentially removing the small species. But by contrast, it's actually removing the large species in the Sinsk. So these metrics are all telling us very, very different things. And they're telling us different things for different taxa. In other words, Although the drivers, the external potential drivers may be the same, the response to those drivers is absolutely not the same. So I suppose this comes down to what the drivers could be. Uh, in a short uh, answer, we don't really know, but here are data from the Siberian platforms. And again, these are only local to Siberian platform. And you can see the carbon isotopes are showing these quite remarkable cycles over a two to three million year time scale. And synchronous with these, time, uh, these cycles are uh, sulfur isotope samples, and they are absolutely synchronous <clears throat> before the SINSC. After the SINSC, it totally breaks down. And the way this has been interpreted is these uh, paired cycles are showing each of these uh, increases of, um, into more positive values is showing a pulse of oxygen into otherwise dominantly anoxic waters and counterwise the, the decreasing limb is showing a loss of oxygen at, uh, in other words a increase of, of uh, anoxia into otherwise oxygenated waters and this is very very dynamic again this is just a hypothesis however as i say these data have been generated by leeds group from a Siberian platform. I've also superimposed here in these red lines, our uh, anoxic events on the basis of other proxies. So the sense is known from various uh, geochemical and just sedimentary proxies as a mass of black shale at this time. But these other uh, red lines show what the, the uranium isotopes show in terms of enhanced anoxia. And you can see there's really not much uh, correlation between these events and these body size changes we see. This is now on a log scale. So it's not really clear what is causing this, but I think the synchronicity alone, particularly of this body size, this behavior of body size increase at the end of the Tomotian early Atabanian, really is showing a response to something external, which is possibly one of these oxic pulses. So these short-lived, pulses of oxygen and probably productivity as well, may be what these biota are responding to. This particular phase always also corresponds to a phase of reef expansion on the Siberian platform. But what is very interesting is not all biota respond in the same way. The brachiopods are absolutely doing their own thing. And even the Sinsk event, whilst it is showing some alliliput effect in some groups, it's actually showing the opposite in other groups. So I think we really need, if we really want to consider the dynamics of how uh, the biota is, is, is responding to what might be happening in the environment, particularly redox and productivity drivers, we must start to get away from 
simple metrics of biodiversity and think about ways in which we can interrogate the role of physiology because the, the choice of these metrics really is very, very important. So just to finalize some concluding thoughts, we're starting to trace the roots back of the Cambrian into potential bilaterians, possibly stem group analog, analog, analids and possibly stem group lophotrochosomes back into the terminal ediacar. And I'm sure there will, will be a lot more forthcoming in, next, uh, in the next decade or so. There's an indication that weathering controls, controlling uh, well, what was ultimately controlling nutrient delivery, productivity, and therefore lo local redox in the late Ediacaran. But these sorts of studies are very much in their inf infancy. And then finally, we have these differential turnovers of, of all our metrics of origination, of biodiversity, of body size, structuring the Cambrian radiation. But really, what's really turning out to be important is how important physiology is. And I think the choice of metrics is important, but also we have barely scratched the surface in really starting to unpick these drivers. So with that, I'll end. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Rachel, very much. That gives a lot for everybody to think about. Um, with that, uh, it's time to open the floor for questions. I just like, need uh, to grab some water if you don't mind. I've got, I'm absolutely. about to have a coughing fit, so give me a moment. Yeah, go right ahead. And uh, Ben Barnes, it looks like you're first up as soon as Rachel gets back. Hello. Okay. Hi. Hi, Rachel. That was a really... Hi, ben. Provoking talk. Thank you. Hi. Thank you. Um, so I guess I, I guess I'm curious because uh, obviously, as as you've alluded to, the Cambrian stands out when looking at Phanerozoic biodiversity trends. It usually gets kind of sliced off. Or thinking about like Sepkowski's Cambrian fauna, which are sort of act sort of unique. So do you think there's an argument to be made that the uniqueness of Cambrian fauna is owing to this? this sort of early testing phase for these physiologies and the sort of trends that you're noticing between the paleo environment and body size and biodiversity. Yes, but I think you could say that about any bit of geological time. I don't think it's necessarily unique for just the Cambrian. Um, the, the Cambrian, the Cambrian is, I, I suspect is going to be turn out to be a very, very dynamic time. But then of course we've got very dynamic intervals in the, early Triassic as well. And I think there are quite strong parallels with, with the, these two events, actually. Um, the, 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 I, I, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer that redox is actually, a dynamic redox is a driver of innovation rather than being a suppressant of, of innovation. Um, I, I think, I think Sepp Koski's, the idea of the Cambrian fauna is, is actually still quite a powerful idea, but I think we can go beyond that now and start to unpick it. Because what's, what I think is very interesting and is not really explored is why are some things getting through this mass extinction, not others? Because the brachiopods are really responding totally differently to this SINSC event compared to everything else. And that surely must be the reason why the brachiopods become to really be quite dominant in the Paleozoic, whereas everything else goes extinct. The highlights, I think one species staggers on into the later Paleozoic. So there's, there, there are, and of course this, this may not be tractable yet, but I think we need to go beyond very simple metrics and go, go to this physiology. And I, it turns out that I think, I think brachiopods are, they have a much lower, um, energy demand actually the mollusks and that may be what you know what is underneath all this if i may quickly ask a clarification uh in your brachiopod data set are uh, is there a distinction in the trends between articulate and inarticulate brachiopods yes we we did we did plot all that up and we also plotted up silicious sponges compared to archaeocyas and i think there is a there is a physiological cost of calcification because the rinconelliform brachiopods show something quite different from the linguleliform brachiopods. So yeah, there, there is more to this story than I've had time to present. Um, but I think there is, a, there is certainly a calcification cost involved too, 
or at least that's our best guess, because the archaeocyaths and the brachiopods, the, ca the calcified rinconella forms, are showing something similar. All right, any more questions for, uh, for Rachel? Oh, Alison Cribb has a question. Go right ahead. Hi, Rachel. Um, thank Hi. you for such a great talk. My pleasure. Um, I have a question about how your redox proxies in the NAMA might relate to what we're seeing in the trace fossil record. Um, I guess where we're seeing those big increases in biodiversity intensity occur, I guess a bit east of where your, your geochemistry measurements are coming from. Um, and something that's really striking to me about the NAMA has always been that we don't find complex trace fossils and like really large trace fossils really anywhere near that we're finding body fossils. Um, and I've been thinking about this in sort of an organic matter delivery um, context, but I was wondering if your redox status could suggest any reason why those habitats might be so different for, for bioturbators and the um, like soft bodied Ediacar biota. I think we cannot dismiss taphonomy and preservation here. Um, you know, it's quite difficult to leave a trace fossil in a very coarse aronite, which is where most of the um, the macrobiota have been, the, the, the soft body and macrobiota have traditionally been covered from, you know, these big quartzite units. But the, um, this Narmacolathus preservation we showed you, this is from a totally different type of lager stata. It's a carbonate lager stata. And I think, that is something that has simply, we need to get away from the largest data in the Ediacaran being dominantly clastic. I think there's an awful lot in the carbonates that remains to be discovered. And I think that might, you know, I would be quite surprised if uh, burrows are not found on those surfaces. We've only just started to interrogate this, these uh, outcrops. Thank you. All right, um, uh, Malgar Zada, it looks like you're lo looking to ask a question. Uh, hi, Rachel. Thank you very much for excellent talk. And I am very, you know, impressed of your consideration that perhaps we may have stem annelids at the end of Diakaran. And I believe that another very strong candidate for the annelid is of the same age, Sabellidites, which many years ago I proposed that it is Annelidan. What do you think about Sabellidites as Annelid? Um, I have never worked on that taxon myself. So I, I would be, I'm familiar with your papers. Um, I, I think we must keep an open mind. I mean, that that I think there would be no surprise to find bilaterians, and of course there are there are things like Kimberella and so forth, which have been proposed to be bilaterians for quite some time. Um, so I, I, I the, the the Claudina work wasn't wasn't my work um, at all, but I, I just think I, I think it, I think this is, these are all possibilities, and we need to do more work and we need to be a little bit more sure. But I think this is opening up now, this area. And I think the, the, really the main point I want to make is that we, we won't get anywhere by viewing the Ediacaran and the Cambrian separately. We must <laughs> put them together. That's really my, my major point. Thank you. But that's just my own personal bug there. No, you have very good points, thank you. All right, go ahead and step in, Paul. Yeah, uh, concerning the Nama group uh, basins, um, Rachel, your your diagrams and commentary um, indicated that the basin configuration was unchanging over geologic time. But Her Herms, uh, you know, over 30 years ago, uh, recognized that the Nama group basins are synorogenic uh, foreland basins, which means they're highly dynamic. The basins are migrating geographically over time so that in any given section, your position within the basin is actually changing. Uh, the northern and southern basins are related to two different orogenic belts, the Damra and the Harip, which had different histories. Uh, both basins are filling in with sediment over time. They both go non-marine in the Cambrian. And so I don't think it's uh, a good idea to assume that 
any changes in the uh, uh, depositional conditions are related to um, imposed conditions from external to the basin. Uh, a lot of these changes could be related to the evolving basin dynamics. I wasn't and suggesting that they were. No, no, I wasn't. I, no, no, Paul, I, I totally agree with you. I wasn't. I wasn't suggesting it's external to the basin. I was suggesting it's related to mostly where, where both weathering from the east, from the Kalahari crater. I, I, of course, I totally take everything you said, and actually, the the plain views are showing. A, a, a shrinking, a shrinking Nama Basin through time, and, and we, we know that the deeper centres are changing. We know all that, but that's that's sort of not the point. The point is that as whether you believe the continental weathering from the east is the, is the driver or not of the of the of the redox stabilisation. But everything you've said is absolutely true, but it, it's it's not counter to the hypothesis that I was presenting. Why do you assume that the sediment is coming from the east? I mean, how do you explain the chromium spinels and uh, you know all the indicators in the detritus that they're ultramafic components, or the detrital zircon data of Blanco that shows uh, uh, a likely source in the northwestern northwestern corner of the Kalahari Craton? Yeah, I mean, I can, I can see Fred has popped. Fred, do you want to respond to that? <laughs> Okay, yeah. Um, so actually, in, in our paper last year, we do take all of those things into account. It's not just the sediment source from the east we thought we're talking about. We also take into account the, the directionality of the sediment source and also the, the shallowing of the Zaris subbasin through time. So it's not, we're not just saying that the sediment source is from the east and that's where all the nutrients come from. Actually, it's very dynamic. It changes throughout the position of the basin, as you're saying. Thank you. So it's all taken into account. It's all in our supplementary information. So it's enormous supplementary information. <laughs> All right, thanks for that. It uh, looks like Theodore Present is ready to ask a question. Go ahead. Hi, uh, thanks so much. I really loved that talk and I really loved the, um, it was the best one I've seen in a while and I loved how it linked the like local and global geochemistry to the fossil record. And I think okay. I had a question that might've been touched on by Allison's expertise in the bioturbation, but I, I don't really know. Do you see in the, like I would imagine as a not a paleontologist that when there's more oxygen you get more oxygen penetration or you could get more oxygen penetration and so you could get more burrowing and uh infaunal organisms and things like that so either like locally in some of your studies or globally in some of these compilations do you see changes in not just the trace fossils but the mode of life in faunal or not of these organisms associated with these geochemical changes well, I, I have never worked on the bioturbation at all. So I, I, can't, I what we what I presented there was was published work mm -hmm. um, as it stands. I mean, we can think of all scenarios, of course, which would um, allow more oxygen to, to penetrate and, and all sorts of positive feedbacks, of course. And there's mm -hmm. many, mm -hmm. many groups working on this and modeling this. Um, I think there are, you know, there, there are still lots of things to be resolved there. Um, you know, what, there's not, as far as I understand, there's not really much consensus yet whether um, it's, some groups propose that really just the tiniest amount of burrowing can really change the oxygen inventory of sediment. Other groups suggest, no, it's really got to be more complex and substantial. So I think there's, that there are really quite profound things that are, are yet to be resolved. But it, of course, bioturbation is a, is a just like is, is, a, is a massive ventilator of sediment, just as things evolving appendages and starting to you know, undergo diurnal migrations and so forth become very, very important ventilators of the oceans. So yes, this is all, this is all these are very important questions, but I'm afraid they're not things I happen to work on. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean, I, I guess I just meant from your data, can you tell if like a given brachiopod is informal or not? And even if you don't see the trace fossils, do you see trends in oh, yes. how many are in faunal versus not in faunal? Um, do you mean the oh, do you mean the the lower Cambrian data set? Yeah, yeah, or, I, I or mean, your work in ED Akron, I guess, but it wouldn't be. Yeah, no, I mean everything there is just sitting on the sea floor. It's, it's an external oh. benthos, um, actually. I mean, you you could look at some. What, what we do see through the, ca the Cambrian radiation is that the, the forms that initially bimineralize 
are all sessile and immobile. And then the forms that are sessile but, but uh, unattached kick in. Then the forms that are mobile kick in and, and eventually the predators and the necton kick in. So in other words, there is, it looks like there's a classic uh, evolutionary escalation of forms with increasing metabolic demand by mineralizing through this ediacaran to cambrian radiation, which makes sense. It's just, it's, uh, it makes sense if, if, if predation is the driver because having a, um, you know, having a protective armor is, is getting, even though it's becoming more costly, the cost benefit is getting more advantageous. So we certainly see that trend through this interval. All right, Shuhai just raised his hand. So go ahead and unmute yourself, Shuhai. Yes, uh, thanks, Rachel. Uh, excellent talk. Hi, Shuhai. Okay. Nice to yeah, see you. Hi, hi, nice seeing you uh, and everyone else. Um, I'm, I'm intrigued by the uh, correlation, at least in some of the groups, uh, between the body size and uh, diversity, uh, for example, archaeosarthrus. But I'm just wondering, because for most um, animal groups, at least, the species size distribution is very right skewed. So a lot of smaller species and a few, a few uh, larger species. So I think the null hypothesis, if you if just you know, get rid of the species in, in, uh, or in a, in a random ex extension without any size selectivity, uh, you're gonna wipe out the larger species because there are just fewer of them. Right, if it's just a random game. So the null hypothesis is that uh, any association with any, any extinction, the body size, the average body size and the, and the, the medium and the, uh, uh, the maximum body size uh, would decrease. So I think you would expect to see, even if there's no size selectivity, uh, you know, size, uh, the average size decrease with diversity. So in other words, there would be a correlation between size and the diversity. Uh, even but the, if there's no but the issue is there activity. isn't. The, the issue isn't there isn't in some of these groups. There is right, no so, so I was wondering, <laughs> so for those groups like archaeothasis, right? There's a major extinction in a sensitive event and there's a major size drop and uh, you know, Maybe the here it's just something random happening. Everything's like there's no size selectivity at all. I, yeah, I mean, the, of course, we can't really answer that question without having abundance data. Um, but I believe abundance data has been considered for the Permo Triassic, the gastropods. And I, I believe it's shown that it's, it's, I mean, there it's, it's, these bedding planes are covered absolutely covered with tiny, tiny gastropods. And it's one thing we see in, in the Sinsk. The other extraordinary thing in the, in the Sinsk, I didn't have time to show it, was while some of these other groups get very small, the average size of spic silicious spicules suddenly becomes enormous. So there you're getting the opposite. Right. So, so I don't know how to explain the opposite. No, I don't either. Um, but yeah, my question is if you do see a correlation, you know, maybe we should think about it. No, yeah. that's, that's all. No, I think, I think that's a good point. And we could answer it with the, you know, as you say, with the, with the abundance data. Um, we don't have any abundance data. Um, okay. Well, th to, thanks, to Rachel. That. Yeah, but I, it's a good point, Shuhai, but I, 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 I don't think... I don't think the null hypothesis alone is going to explain those, in, those really dramatic changes that are synchronous over time. I just don't see how that, that could explain that. Okay, okay. thank okay. you. All right, Hedda, you are next to raise your hand, so go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, Rachel. Hi, Hedda. Thank you so much for such a lovely talk. I wanted to ask a question about sort of the beginning of your talk when you presented that uh, wonderful reconstruction of Namakalathus. Um, you've mentioned sort of uh, pretty large bacteria being preserved uh, around that. Do you see any, um, any indications that those would have been decomposers that were perhaps, you know, munching on whatever soft bodied parts of Namakalathus or were they perhaps some kind of an association that Namakalathus was living in? They were actually, it's actually outside the cup, that coiled form. 
Okay. So I think it's, I mean, it's just an indicator that the preservation is phenomenal, you know, because that's preserved in, in pyroidal, um, cramboidal pyrite as well. So I think that's all it is. It's, a, it's an indication of really exceptional preservation um, of soft tissue. I don't, I don't think it's, I think it's a happen chance association. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, Rachel, I sort of have maybe a broad question, um, broadly just Ediacaran time. But you, you uh, sort of painted a picture of very dynamic redox. Um, and uh, when I think, think about some of what uh, distinguishes the different, um, the different Ediacara biota, uh, part, of, part of that is sometimes the water depth that they're preserved in. I think, right, from white seed and Nama assemblage and the different assemblages. Um, do you think, thinking about the Ediacaran, do you think that this could partially be restricted more by changes in redox through time rather than changes in other, other suggestions for changes in these assemblages? I think we must maintain a very open mind and think about all possibilities that have created the record that we see. Um, I don't think redox is the only story. I think nutrient delivery is another part of the story. I think sampling is part of the story. Um, different taphonomy is a very important. I think we have to, I think it's a multifaceted problem. And I, I, I yeah, no, I would not say redox is the only game in town at all. Yeah. All right, thank you for that. Uh, I'll give just a few more seconds for anybody to raise their hand if they would like to. Okay, go ahead, Ben. Just because you let you uh, ended on the note that redox isn't the only game in town. Do you think there's a role for other aspects of seawater chemistry specifically um, well, I guess vis-a-vis -vis, uh, mineral saturations with respect to calcite. I'm more curious to hear about the biocalcification cost you mentioned earlier. Oh. <clears throat> um, something is definitely going on in terms of the inventory of seawater. I mean, I think it's possible through the Ediacaran that we have changes in phosphorus, uh, possibly sulfate, um, magnesium, calcium, there's, there's an awful lot of early dolomite around in the, uh, in the Egypt current, and there's not really so much early dolomite around, mimetic dolomite around in the Cambrian. So I, th I do think something is changing um, the propensity for early dolomite to be precipitated through this interval. It may or may not have anything to do with magne magnesium calcium ratios. It may be to do with phosphorus. It may be to do with um, anoxia. I think anoxia is likely actually, as, as we, we know there's a correlation between anoxia and early dolomitization. So, um, and I, I Certainly what we see is in the, in the low, in the, if you just look at the early marine cements, the cements and reef cavities in the, uh, in some places like Siberia at the end of the Ediacaran, we see beautiful zoned dolomite cements. Then we see beautiful pseudomorphed aragonite cements. And then by the getting into, um, I suppose the, the at Tabania on Siberian platform, we see the very first low magnesium calcite cements. So there's something happening that's changing those early marine cements through time. It, knowing exactly what the drivers are, I think uh, we need to do a lot more work to, under, to unpick it. But there, there's definitely, the, the carbonate inventory is changing through that interval quite rapidly.
All right, absolutely wonderful today, Rachel. Thank you very much. I think we can we can end on that. It doesn't. I, uh, nobody has raised their hands, but thank you to you and thank you to everybody who participated in the convert discussion at the end. Um, so we will will end for today, and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you all for Jean Bedard next week. So it's very nice to see you all. Great. Thank, thank you for coming. Thank you, and bye-bye. 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 Thank you.